Hello, everyone. My name is Norbert Fabricius. I work at ESR Labs, which is part of uh, Accenture's Industry X uh, initiative. I'm an IT security developer there. Uh, we are located in Munich. And today I want to talk about a newcomer to uh, Eclipse, which is uh, called Eclipse Heimlich. And it's a firmware for hardware security modules. Now, as you may very well know, that modern cars are more or less networks on wheels. I mean, on a modern car, you have more than 100 ECUs talking to one another, trying to keep data secret, customer data, cryptographic keys, all kinds of stuff. And um, to do that, they, not just now, since many years now, have been using hardware security modules. So those are dedicated chips, dedicated components in your ECU that have the job to, well, keep your keys secret and offer cryptographic um, services to the ECU. So let's say you want to encrypt some data to send it to another ECU, or you talk to the HSM, or you want to store something that should stay secret. If, even if somebody starts to read out your flash chips, it should still stay secret. Um, that's what an HSM is for. The HSM never reveals the private keys it has. It generates them for you and you can use them, but you never get them. And if you have a good HSM, so a good hardware, it might even destroy the keys if you try to attack them physically. So it, it rather takes the ship with the keys down than to offer them to you. The HSM hardware though, it only offers low level mathematical operations that you might need for crypto, right? So if, if you, you might need complex mathematical operations to do um, signing using elliptic curves, or you want to do you want to have very fast AES encryption, which could be done in hardware. But that's what the hardware offers you. What you need to make it um, a usable component is firmware. And this is really low level firmware. There's no operating system involved. It's just a single binary running on a single chip with a single purpose. So there's no free RTOS or embedded Linux or Android or anything like that involved, right? So like I said, HSM have been around for a while and they have been hacked for a while. Um, C and C++ has made great strides to get better at that, um, but it's still far too easy to um, um, shoot yourself in the foot, so to say. So to write a program that handles memory wrong enough to be exploitable for somebody to take control over your chip. And memory handling is one of the big issues that people uh, continue to have with C and C++. Another one is data races. So you have one part of your program reading or writing memory and another part doing the same. And whoever comes first might read something or the other or something completely different. It really depends on the hardware. And it is a never ending source of vulnerabilities. I mean, um, not all vulnerabilities are in the open, but some are. Um, at Black Hat 2019, there was this interesting talk by everybody uh, uh, called Everybody Be Cool. This is a robbery. And they just did it all. I mean, they took full control of the HSM. They took all the keys out there. They even managed to get a persistent backdoor in there. So even if you try to wipe your device, you had it would survive. So the component that was supposed to keep your make your car more safe was the one that actually made it more unsafe. Um, this challenge that um, partially uh, stems from C, C++ uh, was one of the motivations for, for the Rust programming language. Right? It tried to learn from the deficiencies. It tried to be reliable and give you strong memory safety guarantees at compile time. So if your code compiles, it's guaranteed that you don't have a race condition in there and that you don't have something like dangling pointers or a race um, um, that writes or reads memory in the wrong order, something like that. And at the same time, it tries to stay efficient. So there's no garbage collection going on or some um, fancy logic that slows down your program. It just compiles to a native binary and the compiler checked everything for you. And last but not least, it still tries to stay productive. So if you have this fancy uh, and hopefully safe language, it wouldn't be any use if you were very slow developing with it. And 
what we did then is to bring those two together and we tried to write an HSM firmware in Rust. And from a very high perspective, it looks like this. Um, it has a very generic core that accepts crypto requests and um, routes them to workers and takes care of the responses that they reach the actual client. And then we have the workers. Those are the ones that do the actual crypto work, right? And you could have a crypto worker for symmetric encryption or one for hashing or one for signing. And the nice thing about the architecture is that these can be um, mixed and matched. So you might have a chip that is has a hardware specific feature that you want to use. So you write a hardware specific worker for it and enable this functionality in the HSM. And then somebody might need another algorithm if he wants to do the latest, coolest thing in hashing and your chip cannot even do that. But you can do it in software and then you can add a software worker. The algorithm is still computed in this um, secure environment of the HSM. It's maybe a little slower. It's done on the CPU, but the user doesn't know. He just sees an HSM, he gives it a task and he gets a response. The whole thing looks like this. So you have your clients on the very left hand side and they talk to a user API. The user API creates requests, puts it into shared memory. So we are leaving one core and now we're going to the HSM core. And then it enters the Heimlich uh, core, which schedules its two workers. It also manages all the keys that might be necessary for this crypto operation. And then it sends it back to the response queue, back to the user API, back to the client. The shared memory in between is what we usually see on hardware, but it's strictly speaking not even necessary. Heim Heimlich doesn't care as long as there is a request and response queue interface provided by the integrator. Right now we have a working prototype. So we run this on a discovery board, um, which runs a Cortex M7 processor. And we already use the hardware random number generator. So it's not just software right now, it's also starting to, um, to use hardware um, specific features. But you can run this if you just want to see it or have a feel for it, you can run it on your Linux laptop. There, it becomes true what I said that it's not really bound to the shared memory interface. If you run it on your Linux laptop, the, the HSM will just be a thread and the clients will be other threads and they just talk to one another as if they were on different cores, which makes it easier for development, but you can still then deploy it on hardware. We implemented all kinds of um, software only uh, algorithms. So um, you have common encryption, hashing, signing and verification and random number generators ready to use. And if you want to bring it to specific hardware, like I said, you would have to code a, a hardware specific worker for your hardware. But there's also still stuff to be done. First, of course, is to publish it on the Eclipse repository, which we are almost done. Um, once we have that, it would be really nice to see contributions, reviews, or just ideas, because as security software goes, the more people look at it, the better. Um, but there's also still technical topics open. So um, while we have this shared memory interface, um, it's easy to write an inefficient interface. It's also easy to write an unsafe interface, but to have it efficient and safe and abstract enough to work on multiple hardwares is a harder challenge. So that's something that we work on. And we need still to parallelize the workers. So right now um, stuff works kind of sequentially, which is okay, but way slower than it needs to be. And if we ever want to use it in the field, um, there is still the topic of software update and JTAG unlocking. So JTAG unlocking is needed to get debug access to the chip and software update is needed to whenever you find a flaw is to update it in the field. So there's still technical topics open there and probably a lot to improve, but that's what we want to contribute to Eclipse. So yeah, that was my quick rundown of Eclipse Heimlich. Any questions? Hello. 
Next to the native benefit that, that Rust brings over C and C++, what makes you confident that you are not part of Black Hat 2024? <laughs> I, I'm not sure, right? Uh, there is no silver bullet for, for any security, right? You always set the bar higher, and that's what we're trying to do. But there is always, it, it's this eternal race, right, between the attackers and the defenders. So I hope it's not Black Hat 2024, but maybe down the road might very well be possible. Um, but that being said, I think the the tools in the C, C++ space, they made great progress, right, to make code safer. But there is a limit kind of, in my opinion, in the design of the language, and that's, I think, where we can still improve and make it make it even safer. Okay, thank you. Maybe follow-up question, did you did any kind of pen testing or something like that? Um, not yet. Um, this is not the only uh, open source project that we did at Azar. And um, I expect at some point uh, when this is um, far enough, we will do for sure uh, need a pen test. Um, one, because it's just useful. On the other hand, because it's also mandated by customers. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks. Sure. Um, hi. <laughs> if you are at the next Black Hat, that means you are relevant in a product. So that might be even good. Well, <laughs> every publicity is good publicity, right? <laughs> now, quick question. And I mean, this might be obvious, but it's just not my area of expertise. These HMN chips, HSM chips, how varied is are the implementations out there? I mean, is there some form of unification alignment so that you can, you know, with kind of one implementation at least cover a part of that market or is everybody doing their own thing there? As far as I can see, the hardware vendors are everybody's doing their own thing. And it is really it's it's wild. I mean, it's even there is not a big push to unify this because everybody thinks you can do it better and sell it, right? And one of the challenges is to have a firmware that is that kind of extracts all the generic parts that are useful and open source. And when it comes to actual hardware, the integration into a product, that will be something that is then very specific to the vendor. So as long as they are not standardizing, the best thing that we can do is abstracting, right? Thank you. Oh, there you go. Um, I was wondering um, if there is um, in this project any relation to uh, the global platform TE specification or Opti or EQC as 11 as an interface or something like that. Like for interfacing, like let's say I, I want to do a sign verify thing or something, I can um, today I have like in my user space, I can call PQCS 11 and interface APIs like do this. Um, is that something that you have or looked into or thought about? Something like that? I think PKCS 11 would live above this, right? So if you have a user application right. and then you call the PKCS 11 call, it would have to decide how to do it, right? It might do it in software and, and that's all like hidden from the user. And depending, well, in one project, it might decide to, okay, this is something that we can do in the HSM. So it will okay. then route that. And basically your PKCS11 API would sit between the client API, uh, between the client application there and the user API. Okay, so I would have a like a back binding to, to your user API. Right, right. right. Okay. A user API is, the HSM API facing the user. And okay. if you want to put PKCS11 in front of that, sure, you can do that. Got it. I'm also not an expert in the hardware aspect, at least. Um, so I was wondering, how does your firmware actually get on this chip? How we flash it, the chip? It, it might be trivial to you, but I'm, I, I have no idea. Sorry. So how does that work, practically? Uh, 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 it's very good that uh, the Rust ecosystem is is old enough to have a lot of this stuff covered already, so we didn't have to implement that stuff. Um, we are using Probe RS, which is a is a Rust framework that um, handles exactly that aspect, so uh, flashing, but also um, debugging for all kinds of different chips. 
So that's at least for the discovery board um, is what we are using right now. Um, for customer projects, it might be different. Um, I think it really comes down to how is it integrated. So another project that might be possible is that you have uh, a C++ bring up code and that one triggers um, the Heimlich binary and you all flash it with a commercial tool. So for example, a Lauterbach debugger would be possible. Um, it's kind of independent of it, right? So Heimlich is just a binary and how you bring it on it, um, Heimlich doesn't even know. And then I was wondering what what sense does it make to use a hardware security module and then implementing the cryptographic algorithms in software? That's a fair question. Um, one big point is that uh, the storage of the keys is um, handled by the um, HSM still. So whether or not this ECC component uses the CPU or not, um, the keys don't care. So the keys are still safe. They are um, encrypted or stored within the uh, HSM core. And the only thing that happens if you do it in, uh, uh, in software is it's likely to be slower. And if you have a very, very um, high uh, requirement, then you might want to use it in hardware so it um, works in constant time. So nobody attacks your device because sometimes it's faster or slower. But other than that, I'd say that the um, uh, greatest benefit is that you even do even if you do it in software, you stay in this secure environment that you created in this chip. You have a question online. Uh, do right. you support PKCS11? Oh yeah, I think we had that one. Um, PKCS11 would be something that is solved on the application side, so it is not part of the HSM, but you might build PKCS11 on top of the HSM. Thanks. Actually, I have, a, I have a curiosity. So, how many of you are using Rust? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, go away. Yeah. Ah, okay, fine. No, but really, can can you can you raise your hands again? Wow. Okay. It's maybe sorry. Yeah, go ahead with Rust. I I, I just want to circulate an idea, completely unprepared. Yeah, that's fine. Um, no, I, I'm amazed how many people are using Rust now. So, yeah. I didn't expect it either. I didn't expect it either. And so one quick question about uh, about this. So the core capability of your project, is it it's a like standard HSM implementation, but it is in Rust? Is it like what is special is the programming language? It's the programming language for one yeah. and the possibility to mix and match the software and hardware workers Okay. Also, yeah, okay. so because in some projects um, you find out during the project, oh, you needed that algorithm while well, you bought the wrong chip, and then that's it. Somebody has okay. to do something, and to be able to add algorithms to your HSM, even though the hardware does not support it, is also a benefit. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, one quick question to the forty-two Wolfsburg guy. Your students, what language do they use? I. I yeah, it's a big problem. So as, as the concept, we do not suggest uh, okay. technology to use uh, yeah. while studying. So it's, so it's not suggested. Okay, okay. The best, but our students are already catching up. Okay, now good to know. So yeah, now sorry for hijacking the discussion. So okay. at the Embed World, we met with a couple of people and so we discussed about Rust and Rust and Automotive and Rust Automotive best practices. So I'm just curious. So we, we, we circulate the idea. Maybe we have a special interest group on, on these kind of topics for Rust. I'm wondering there were so many people now developing in Rust. Just wondering, I just want to make aware that there's this discussion and if you would maybe be interested to join such a discussion, um, let us know, right? So if we would have enough members together who are interested in setting up a discussion forum, let me call it that way, about yeah, Rust and yeah. best practice in Rust. So I, I'm not sure if we will ever see MISRA Rust or Rust rules or MISRA That's rules for exactly. Rust, whatever. But I think having these kind of best practice and discussion around these best practices, I'm aware that there has been happening something at the mm -hmm. SAE yeah. and you can buy it for money, which is maybe from our open source perspective, not the best best idea. Also, and that's something where we may have an idea to, to also do something similar. To add to this quick piece of information, um, 
gentleman from Exeter and CodeThink had a presentation last year where they just, you know, compared the standard MISRA rule set to the default features provided by Rust runtime and compiler. And the outcome was that 96 plus percent of MISRA is already covered Perfect. by Rust vanilla, right? So there's like 4% to talk about maybe. Unfortunately, there's more there than MISRA. So I think still have automotive Rust best practices. Could, I don't, don't get me wrong. I just want to mention that there has been a discussion started about maybe setting up a group of people who would be interested to talk about this under the umbrella of the SDV working group. And since there was a couple of people now saying, hey, we do something in Rust, if you are interested, just reach out to Sarah or myself. And if there's a critical mass, we could set up a first meeting, first call. And yeah, then it's up to you, the community, to discuss these kind of things. The Ferris systems involved already? Yeah, he okay. was. That was one of the persons at the Embedded World talking to us.